I was just in Paris a couple of days ago, uh, and I cut my, uh, my trip there short in order to make it to this conference. This is, of course, the Eiffel Tower uh, on a recent afternoon as photographed by one of my colleagues uh, at the Times. I wanted to talk to you today about a basic question. How did we get here? How is it that a major European capital, uh, no less the City of Lights, is now a place where you regularly see this? Soldiers in bulletproof vests. This is a scene that you see in every major uh, tourist district uh, in Paris, even as life uh, continues on as normal. The prevailing theory that I hear uh, as a reporter based in America, uh, which is being pushed in press conference after press conference uh, in Washington, is that the Islamic State is losing ground in Iraq and Syria, and that as it is being squeezed, they are lashing out. So the idea is this. This is a terror group which once was interested in governing the territory they held and in fighting the so-called near enemy. And as a result of coalition pressure, they pivoted and they are now lashing out and focusing on the far enemy, namely the, the, the West and Europe, i.e. in an act of revenge. The problem with this now accepted analysis is that it's not supported by the data. And to me, it speaks volumes to how little understood the Islamic State remains now more than two years after its meteoric rise. I wanted to share with you the data that I have collected, which shows that ISIS fighters were returning to Europe to carry out attacks as early as the very first days of 2014, meaning more than six months before ISIS declared its caliphate and a full nine months before airstrikes began against the group in Syria. My approach to reporting on this group uh, has been first through documents. I have by now collected over 100,000 pages of investigation files from France's domestic intelligence agency, of course without their permission, uh, as well as from Belgian, German, and Austrian police and intelligence services. And I wanted to walk you through uh, what I found. <coughs> the first clue that the Islamic State was getting into the business uh, of international terrorism came on January 3rd of 2014. It was on that afternoon in, that police in the town of Oristiada in Greece pulled over a taxi on this highway here. The town of Oristiada in Greece is located just four miles from the Turkish border, and it was about to become one of the major crossing points for migrants trying to enter Europe. So the Greeks pulled over what they thought was a suspicious car, and in the car they found a man named Ibrahim Boudina. That's him there. Boudina was a 23-year-old French citizen who had grown up near the resort city of Khan. He was later radicalized in a mosque in the city of Khan. And he was, in fact, returning from Syria. And on him, the police found a USB stick. And on the USB stick, they found this. This is a bomb-making manual. Uh, it shows how to make triacetone triperoxide, also known as TATP. I'm just going to flash a little through the diagrams here. It's written in French. It's over 50 pages long. Um, let me go back to, to the top. Um, TATP is the type of explosive that will later be used in the suicide belts of the Paris attackers and in the suitcase, bomb, suitcase uh, bombs that the Brussels airport and metro bombers uh, created. It was also this explosive, or rather the precursor chemicals that are used to make it, that were found in several other foiled ISIS plots in Europe. I want you to notice a few things. Number one, uh, please notice at the top right <laughs> um, corner, uh, the, the black flag uh, on the right. This is, of course, the ISIS flag. And the title uh, of, the, of the manual in French is Réalisation de bombes artisanales au nom d'Allah. Literally, how to make artisanal bombs in the name of Allah. Um, it, just as an aside, uh, I wrote an article that mentioned this uh, manual and its title uh, a few months ago in, in, the, in the New York Times, uh, and I translated the title just like that, How to Make Artisanal Bombs in the Name of Allah, and I was ruthlessly teased on Twitter uh, by readers who found the use of the word artisanal um, funny, <laughs> as an artisanal beer, etc., and one person said that this is proof positive that ISIS must have imported its bomb maker from Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> So um, again, here, here is the manual, and here are some of its pages. Uh, in order to understand uh, what this was, I sent this manual. It's, it's over 50 pages long. Um, 
to Professor Jimmy Oxley, who is considered the top expert on TATP uh, in the United States uh, and who has been studying the use of TATP by terrorist groups, uh, including testing the blood and, um, and tissue sample of some of the Paris attackers for the explosive. She read it um, uh, through a translator, and she confirmed uh, that the formula and the steps in the manual uh, are indeed accurate, meaning that if somebody followed the steps in this manual, they will indeed create the explosive TATP. TATP is a type of explosive that is ideal for use in Western countries. Why? The reason is because it's made from commonly available household products. It has two basic ingredients. The first is hydrogen peroxide, which is used in, um, in hair salons to bleach hair. I'm sure you've heard the, the term peroxide blonde the opposite of me, um, and secondly, acetone, uh, which is a solvent and which you can find in America, you can find it at Home Depot uh, in cleaning supplies. What's key to know about TATP is that this is the compound that has become ISIS's signature explosive in Europe. Al-Qaeda used TATP uh, before ISIS, but unlike ISIS, Al-Qaeda was more heterogeneous in its, in its choice of explosives. In Europe and in America, they also used PETN, uh, and deri derivatives of TATP, whereas so far ISIS has been remarkably consistent in only using TATP so far, both in successful and in foiled attacks in Europe. TATP is crucially not the type of explosive that ISIS uses inside Iraq and Syria, and it's also not the explosive that they use just across the border uh, in Turkey when they carry out suicide attacks. Those bombs are military grade, they're mostly nitrate based, they include TNT and C4. And those explosives are much more powerful. Jimmy Oxley explained to me um, that if you're a terrorist and you want to blow something to high heaven, your first choice is going to be one of these military grade explosives uh, or one of these nitrate based explosives. But the nitrate based explosives are highly regulated in Western countries. The ingredients that you need to make them, uh, just buying them would set off alarm bells. And so it's not possible for them to use those in Western Europe. TATP, because it's made from commonly uh, available household goods, is therefore the choice explosive when you're going to Western countries. So Boudina shows up with this manual in French no less, bearing the ISIS logo and showing step-by-step -step instructions on how to make an exclusive that is ideal for use in the West. This is in the first couple of days of 2014. I googled the language that was used in this manual, and I can't find it online. So this doesn't appear to be some sort of cut and paste uh, job. I'm not 100% I'm not sure of that because I haven't been able to check all of it, but it seems to have been a manual that ISIS produced in the French language, no less. And given that he's arrested on January 3rd, 2014, and given that we know from his uh, travels that he left Syria in 2013, that suggests that in 2013, ISIS created a, a manual, a 50-page manual, in the French language on how to make this explosive that is especially used, uh, especially useful in Europe uh, and especially useful to somebody who speaks French. <laughs> so the police in Greece um, did not have an international arrest warrant for Boudina. So one of the ironies here is that Boudina, despite having you know, the Allah's manual on how to make bombs, um, is allowed to keep going. However, they do call uh, French authorities, and the French um, had already been wiretapping his family, uh, his mother, his best friends, and so they were alerted to the fact that he was on his way back. He's arrested in February of 2014 in his family's apartment, which is located on the French Riviera, a short drive from the promenade um, in Nice, which would later be, um, be attacked, and in a utility closet in the same building where he's arrested, Police go on to recover three Red Bull soda, can, soda cans filled with TATP. Here's a grainy picture from the police file. I know it's a little, it's a little hard to see. Uh, what the police file says is that they each, each of these um, uh, objects contained around 300 grams of TATP. They were ready to use, um, and, uh, and they basically arrest him uh, just before he, he presumably goes on to carry out his act. They also found his tablet computer and they went through his search history. Here are the keyword searches um, that he conducted in the days before his arrest. Acetone, hydrogen peroxide, oxygenated water, 
Uh, these are, of course, the ingredients uh, used to make TATP, and so investigators surmised that he was looking for places to buy the chemicals uh, in France. He also Googled list of military camps, Jewish Defense League, wigs, disguises, masks. That led investigators to conclude that he was planning an attack either on a military target or a Jewish one, or else on the annual carnival on the French Riviera, which was due to, to debut just a few days um, after, uh, after his arrest. He was booked on terror charges, but he was described as having acted alone. And in the initial press reporting uh, on his arrest, his affiliation with ISIS was not even mentioned. But the surveillance that the French conducted on his family and on his closest friends paints a very different picture. Before his return to France, Boudina's mother received a telephone call from an unidentified person in Syria who telephoned her to tell her that her son had been sent on a quote-unquote mission. Later, French intelligence uh, intercepted a call between two of Boudina's good friends. The two, who of course don't realize they're being, they're being recorded, are fretting about how to break a particular piece of bad news uh, to Boudina's mother. If you study the tr this transcript as I have, it becomes apparent that the, that the friends are aware that Boutina is returning to carry out a suicide act and that they are debating whether or not to tell his family ahead of time. At one point, one of the callers says, everyone in Syria knows about it. So let me be clear, I can't say for sure that Ibrahim Boudina came back to carry out an, this attack uh, uh, on the orders of ISIS or that he came back just on his own accord. But the details of his case, I feel, are certainly suggestive. What is clear is that he is the first European member of ISIS to return from Syria with the intention of committing, committing violence. And after him, I was able to identify two dozen other foreign fighters, most of them French and Belgian, uh, who returned to Europe from Syria in uh, 2014 and the first part of 2015, leading up to the Paris attacks last November. The majority of these fighters were arrested before they could carry out acts of violence. What that means is that there was very little coverage. I, I can tell you from, from my own newsroom, we are just chasing one disaster after another. No one has time to really report on the, on the foil plots. And I think that's one of the conceptual errors here. There have been a lot of foil plots, and the foil plots, in my opinion, are just as instructive as the successful ones uh, regarding this terror group's intentions. Let me give you one concrete ex example, which now uh, takes us to May 24th, 2014. That was the day that a gunman burst into the Jewish Museum in Brussels and gunned down four people. We are now in May of 2014, exactly one month before the declaration of the caliphate and still four months before the, the, the first Hellfire missile is fired from an American plane uh, over Syria. To me, this is data point number two. The attacker's name was Mehdi Namouche. Uh, he was identified um, as having uh, joined ISIS uh, in Syria. Uh, and immediately after the attack, uh, despite his affiliation, Belgium's deputy prosecutor dismissed any connection to ISIS. At a press conference, she told reporters he probably acted alone. Officials continued to describe him as essentially a lone wolf, even after he was arrested and the ISIS flag was found in his belongings. They continued to do so, interestingly, um, even after Nicolas Enon, sorry, this is the, this is the convoy uh, of cars after they arrested um, Mehdi Namouche, but, but French officials continued to describe Mehdi Namouche as a lone act actor, even after Nicolas Enon uh, identified him as one of the ISIS guards who had tortured him. Nicolas is the, is the young man who's greeting his daughter here. Uh, he was one of the four French hostages that was captured by ISIS. Uh, part of his captivity uh, was spent al alongside the American hostages, and at one point for several weeks, he was handcuffed to American James Foley. Nicola uh, was in front of the TV uh, when Mehdi Namouche, uh, when, when the, the attacker's mugshot uh, appeared, and he instantly recognized Namouche as one of the men who had tortured him during his captivity. We now know that the Western hostages were one of the most valuable assets that ISIS had. The French journalists, as just one example, were ransomed for millions of euros apiece, paid for by the government, of course. Only trusted members of the group had access to the prisons and to the cells uh, where the Western hostages were held. And only truly insiders uh, of ISIS had the intimate access that the Mouche had, which allowed him to torture and to abuse one of the European hostages. 
So the Brussels Museum attacker was far from a lone wolf. He was somebody who was well ensconced uh, in ISIS's network. Yet it wasn't until after the Paris attacks last November that French officials finally set the record straight. They added one more detail. Mehdi Nemouche's phone logs in the months before he attacked the Brussels Museum indicated that he had been in direct telephone contact with Abdel Hamid Abaoud, the on-the-ground planner of the Paris attacks. Uh, more on that uh, a few minutes from now. Again, up to this point, I still can't say for sure whether the fighters who returned to Europe were sent by ISIS, the organization, or if they returned of their own accord and were acting essentially on an individual initiative. But soon after the Brussels Museum attack, we start to see the outlines of command and control and the hand of ISIS guiding the organization. We're now in June of 2014. On June 29th of, of that month, the Islamic State announced the establishment of the caliphate. It came in the form of an audio message from this man, uh, Abu Muhammad al adnani the group's official spokesman, uh, who's pictured here. It would take another three months before President Obama ordered the first airstrikes in Syria, which began again in September of 2014. Let me share with you what else happened in June of 2014. Faiz Bushran, data point number three. Um, on the 20th of June, two French nationals who had trained in Syria left the country with orders to carry out attacks. The first one was a fighter named Faiz Bushran. Uh, he headed to Beirut, where he's arrested just before uh, carrying out a suicide mission on a Shia target. Up on the screen is one of the French intelligence briefs I was able to obtain. It's dated uh, November of 2014, and it's a summary of the known cases uh, of French nationals who had returned from Syria up until that point uh, with the aim of carrying out attacks. On the first page, you can see Ibrahim Boudina's name, uh, which is right there at the bottom. Uh, and on page two, uh, they cite the case uh, of Faiz Bushran. I'm sorry that it's a little, uh, it's a little fuzzy. Um, it's in the second paragraph, Faiz Bushran and Mohammed Reda Wurani. Um, Here's a sentence that I want you to notice. Uh, it's in French, uh, and they're talking about what Faiz Bushran, so the attacker, uh, told his interrogators. Il a avoué la réalité de ce projet, commandité par Abu Muhammad al adnani en personne. Translating for you, they're saying that Faiz Bushran confessed to the truth regarding his, his project or mission, and crucially, he acknowledged that it had been commanded by Abu Muhammad al adnani in person. So already in June of 2014, again, before the caliphate is even declared, we have the first case of a foreign fighter being dispatched outside Iraq and Syria to carry out a suicide mission, and the person ordering the attack is none other than one of the senior most members of ISIS. Notice the next part. Faiz Bushran doesn't leave Syria alone. He left with a friend of his uh, whose name was Mohammed Urani. They split up. Faiz Bushran goes to Beirut and Urani makes his way back to France. Uh, Urani makes it as far as the Créteil district uh, outside of Paris in France, where he too is arrested. The intelligence brief goes on to say that when Urani was arrested, French investigators were able to determine that he was, quote unquote, in communication with an interlocutor in Syria, so presumably getting orders from a handler. I don't have time today to share with you all of the other foil plots, so instead I'm just going to um, uh, put up a summary here. Uh, and mind you, these are just the cases in 2014 of French fighters. Um, and also, please remember that I don't have a security clearance. Uh, I have now brought you chronologically uh, to basically the first week of July of 2014. Every plot that I've described so far was carried out, again, before the first airstrike landed in Syria. And in the months that followed, ISIS's territory would balloon to the largest that it ever held. Yet the fighters dispatched to Europe continued arriving on Europe's doorsteps in a steady trickle that became later a steady rhythm. This is why I believe that the hypothesis that the group is striking the West because it is being squeezed and because it is lo losing territory is, in my opinion, flawed. Let me fast forward now um, to uh, 2015 and to 2016 and to the arrests that allow us to learn about the unit inside ISIS that we believe is responsible for exporting terror abroad. I've taken to calling uh, this ISIS's external operations branch or its external operations unit. It's identified in Arabic as the Emni. 
In January of 2015, so I, I started at the Times in, um, in March uh, of 2014, and as one does in their first year at a new job, I, I, I felt that it was um, inappropriate for me to take vacation. So in January of 2015, I was literally taking my first vacation um, since starting uh, at my new job. I had gone back to Dakar, Senegal, where I had an apartment, and I was celebrating the new year with my family. Uh, and it abruptly came to an end on January 7th, 2015, when my editor called me and asked me to get on the next plane uh, to Paris. Um, attackers had stormed uh, the offices of Charlie Hebdo, the satirical uh, newspaper, and I reached uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport the next day uh, at exactly the moment when all of France uh, stopped for a minute of silence to commemorate the victims. And I remembered that I was by the carousel at, uh, at baggage claim when the call to silence was broadcast uh, on the air airport's intercom. And I saw passengers from all over the world, and my flight was coming from Africa, uh, their luggage in their hands um, stopped in silence, some of them wiping away tears, uh, observing uh, that moment. Charlie Hebdo, as we now know, was not ISIS. It was rather uh, commanded uh, by uh, two young men uh, who were loyal to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It was an enormous event in France, and I spent the next month reporting on it. But the scale of the coverage and the attention we in the media placed on that important but also singular event meant that we missed a plot that was foiled just one week later in Belgium, which in retrospect was perhaps equally, if not more important, and pointed to what was going to happen next. This is an image um, taken by my colleagues uh, in the town of Verviers uh, in Belgium. And on the 15th of January, so really literally a week uh, after Charlie Hebdo, uh, police raided an apartment in this town uh, and uh, there they shot and killed two ISIS fighters, uh, both Belgians, who had returned to Belgium from Syria. Inside the apartment, they found an arsenal. Let me tell you what it included, and now my source is a Department of Homeland Security uh, intelligence assessment. This is what they say. Belgian law enforcement discovered automatic firearms, precursors for the explosive triacetate triperoxide, TATP, body camera, multiple cell phones, handheld radios, police uniforms, fraudulent identifi identification doc documents, and a large quantity of cash. <coughs> and for the first time, we start hearing the name Abdel Hamid Abawood. Abawood, who's um, here uh, in one of the last images uh, that we have of him, according to European intelligence officials, had been directing the plot in Verviers, Belgium, by phone from a safe house in Athens. Investigators rushed to Athens uh, to try to encircle the apartment uh, where they thought he was holed up, but he slipped through. And several weeks later, in February of 2015, he appears triumphantly uh, in the pages of ISIS's magazine, Dabiq. He identified himself uh, by his nom de guerre, uh, Abu Omar al-Baljiki, and he brags about having slipped in and out of Europe under the nose uh, of its security services. I remember that when that issue of Dabiq came out, Western analysts and officials scoffed uh, at what they, what they said was, was his grandiose claims. Uh, they pointed out that there was no real evidence that he had actually gone back to Syria, that this image could have been staged, you know, the ISIS flag could have been uh, photoshopped uh, in the back. Uh, because months later, yet it, to me it was another missed clue, because months later French officials would re reveal that Abawood was the planner of not just the foiled Vervier attack, but the phone logs linked him to Mehdi Namouche, once again the Brussels Museum attacker, indicating that the two of them had spoken before that attack. And a few months later, after Vervier, in April of 2015, his name would come up again, this time as one of the ISIS handlers who was guiding a young man who tried to open fire on a church in Villejuif, a suburb uh, of Paris. Abdul Hamid Abaoud is a Belgian national uh, who was born to a family of Moroccan immigrants. Uh, he grew up mostly in Brussels. Uh, his dad was a shopkeeper, and um, like many of these radicalized young men, his background doesn't necessarily point to where he ended up. Uh, his father sacrificed um, their well-being to put him in an elite Catholic private school. Uh, it didn't seem to do much for him, and he ended up <laughs> uh, becoming a petty criminal by the time he was uh, in his late teens, ending up uh, in jail for, for, for various burglaries and, and other uh, other crimes. We believe that he left for Syria sometime in 2013. Months later, when Belgians, uh, when Belgian police searched his apartment, they found the ISIS flag. It had been drawn directly uh, onto the wall of the residence using a black marker. 
Little, little is known about uh, Abba Wood's progression through the ranks of ISIS. But by June of 2015, we have someone who, who met him in Raqqa, who has eyes on him in Raqqa, and who, crucially, who confirms Abba Wood's rule inside the Emni, which is the term uh, that we have learned uh, is, is the term for this branch inside of ISIS responsible for exporting uh, terror attacks abroad. This is the interrogation of Nicolas Moreau. Uh, Nicolas was a, um, a French uh, convert uh, to Islam. He, he grew up um, Christian. Uh, and he goes and joins the Islamic State. Uh, and in Raqqa, he, um, at, at a certain point, ends up running a restaurant. The restaurant was popular with ISIS fighters. And as a result, he interacted with Abu Wood as well as with several others of the, of the Paris attackers. Uh, Nicola is arrested on June 25th uh, of 2015. And here's his first interrogation session uh, with French intelligence. You'll see his name here uh, on the left, Nicolas Moreau. And in the course of his inter interrogation, he explains to French investigators that he personally knew the three brothers uh, who traveled back to, uh, to Belgium to plot an attack. He's referring, of course, to the foiled Vervier plot. He gives their cunyas uh, and says that Abu Hamza and Abu Zubair were, were killed in the ensuing police raid. Yep, that's all true. And then here's the crucial part. Translating from the French, he says, the third one who was in Belgium, fled. And I saw him in Raqqa, in Syria. I know that he now works for the Emni. He says that the man he's referring to goes by the nom de guerre, uh, Abu Omar, that he's from Brussels, he's around 25, and he's of Moroccan an ancestry, which is exactly Abba Wood's um, makeup. He then goes on to define the Emni. The Emni, he says, is the internal security wing of the Islamic State. And at the same time, the Emni is in charge of sending spies to Europe. Later interrogations uh, with, um, with yet more ISIS fighters uh, arrested upon their return to Europe helps us flesh out what the Emni is and Abu Wood's role inside it. We learned that Adnani, the spokesman of ISIS, who, who gives the first orders to face Bushran, is the head of the Emni. Abu Wood was a mid-level manager. And Abu Wood, uh, before his death, was in charge of selecting fighters for operations in Europe, especially in France. He and the other officials of the Emni did this by keeping tabs on the dormitories that ISIS had set up uh, just um, uh, at, the, at, the, at the entrance to their territory. It was there that new recruits uh, were housed upon their uh, arrival, and they had to undertake uh, an intake interview where their various attributes uh, were essentially noted down. Any European uh, fighter who came through at a certain point became of interest to the Emni, and uh, we have multiple testimonies from German, Belgian, uh, French, Spanish uh, foreign fighters who say that they were approached by the Emni and asked to return to Europe almost immediately to carry out attacks. The training that they received varied greatly. One recruit that, um, uh, that, that spoke at length said that he was in Raqqa for a total of about a week. Uh, three of those days were for target training. Uh, one day was for learning encryption, and then boom, he was sent back to Europe uh, with the aim of carrying out an attack in France. Others, um, by contrast, uh, were enlisted in the equivalent of a special forces unit where they underwent months and months uh, of rigorous training. Last month, I was able to get a jailhouse interview uh, with this young man. His name is Harry Sarfo. He's a German recruit to ISIS, and he was approached by the Emni on the third day after his arrival in Syria in 2015. They tried repeatedly to recruit him to return to Europe because he had many of the attributes that they were looking for. For one, he speaks fluent English. He's also a fluent German speaker. Uh, he had lived in London as well as in Germany, so they thought that they could have him go between the two territories. Um, and he had a criminal background, which actually was of interest to ISIS because in Europe it's not so easy to, to find weapons. And they thought that if he had a criminal past, he would have the contacts to essentially uh, be, be able to get uh, firearms. Harry sat down with me for several hours um, inside his prison in Oldenburg, uh, Germany. Uh, and he explained to me uh, that when the Emni approached him, they tried relentlessly to recruit him. When he kept on saying no, they finally explained to him that they had what they described as a vexing problem. He told me that the officials in the Emni said that they had already sent numerous recruits to both Germany and to England, but none of them had followed through. This is him speaking to me. 
They told me that there aren't many people in Germany who are willing to do the job. They said that they had some in the beginning, but one, but one after another, you could say, they chickened out because they got scared, cold feet. I wanted to end today's talk by quoting what Harry told me. He says he then asked uh, the EMNI officials in front of him, well, what about France? I mean, you're having troubles in Germany, in England. What about France? I asked them about France, and they started laughing, but really serious laughing with tears in their eyes. And they said, don't worry about France. Mafi mushkila, which in Arabic means no problem. We have enough people in France who are ready to give their life for Amir Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. That conversation took place eight months uh, before the attacks uh, in Paris last November. November 13th uh, found me in Iraq. Uh, I had been there for about five weeks uh, and had been waiting for the city of Sinjar uh, to fall, which had been described to me as a, as a critical um, a critical point uh, in the battle because the city st uh, stood on the highway connecting Mosul in Iraq with Raqqa uh, in Syria. <laughs> I waited and waited. The, um, the operation kept on being uh, postponed. And literally on November 13th, on the morning of November 13th, uh, the Peshmerga and the PKK entered the city. Uh, and I spent that morning going from house to house. I even picked up an ISIS flag as a, as a souvenir. And um, <laughs> That evening, uh, I got a call from my editor once again asking me to, to rush to Paris. Um, the joke amongst my, amongst my colleagues, you know, usually when you go to Iraq, your colleagues always express, you know, some concern about you. But the joke was, of course, you know, it seems to be safer in Iraq uh, than in Paris. Um, this was one of the scenes that awaited me. Thank you for your time. Are you referring to Mohammed Mara's uh, attack? Um, yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, it, I believe the attack you're referring to was an attack by a young, young man uh, named uh, Mohammed Mara. Uh, ISIS did not exist as an entity as we know it uh, today at that point. Uh, but Mohammed Mara um, has served as, as a point of inspiration for many uh, of the attackers that are now in ISIS. Um, uh, I've, been, I've managed to get that dossier, and what is interesting to see is that so many of the, of the best known names uh, in uh, the Islamic State, including Fabien Klein, who's the French foreign fighter who took credit for the no November 13th attacks, had links either direct or oblique uh, to that attacker. So we don't, I, I don't quite know what to make of that attack, uh, but on the inspirational front, uh, it's been very important. Yes, sir. Uh, just to recap. Yes, sir. Uh, this, the message you are giving us is that the attribution to the IS of attacks in Europe, uh, that they were being squeezed, is not correct. I don't think the data backs it up. I think that this is, I think what, it, what the data shows is that this is a group that was attempting to attack the West at the same time that it was holding and governing uh, territory. And that we let ourselves uh, be blinded to that because many of the early attacks were foiled and therefore they were not covered properly. And then after that conversation about French security would indicate what? It indicates to Harry Sarfo that they have more than enough recruits in France. This is, of course, a conversation that happens in 2015, uh, in April of 2015, so things might have changed since then. But in April of 2015, they were having a hard time getting attackers in Germany and England. They've clearly rectified Germany. We've had several um, ISIS-linked uh, attacks there. We haven't yet, thankfully, had any in England. Yes. French have had a significant number of people who are North Africans and Muslims going back to their involvement in Algeria and Morocco. I'm wondering if these people are a significant number of the recruits by ISIS or Al-Qaeda, um, or have they become Frenchified, for lack of a better phrase? <laughs> 
so there's, I think there's two parts of your question. Um, as far as foreign fighters uh, joining ISIS, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, th I think Tunisian foreign fighters are, are probably the largest chunk. Is that, is that right, Paul? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the Maghreb region um, has played a very important role. As far as the French foreign fighters, uh, at least anecdotally from what we see, a lot of them uh, are of Maghrebian ancestry, Moroccan or, or Algerian, but they're usually second generation. Um, but I don't want to make too, too much of that because then there's also people that completely buck the, the trend, like Nicolas Moreau. This guy was a, you know, a convert, a Christian convert uh, to the group. So they really do come from all walks of life as well. So, um, I, I uh, enjoyed your presentation. Uh, thank you for that, um, the, the analysis that you put forward that, that the expeditionary attacks are not necessarily the rationales we, we analyzed it previously. What do you think the implication is for the danger of ISIS as an entity? So there tends to be two theories out there. Either ISIS is kind of on the way, kind of being pushed back, uh, kind of collapsing the end, or that they're a more sophisticated user of modern technology and, and more long-term threat than people think. Mm. That's, a, that's a complicated question, but... Um, <laughs> Number one, I think that there's there's an obsession in our in our public policy with the territorial caliphate. To be sure, the territorial caliphate is extremely important to ISIS's brand. The idea that they hold these uh, these places that have resonance in the hadiths and the Quran that are part of their their end of times uh, prophecy um, is is a very useful recruiting tool. But even when you take those things away, you end up with basically what ISIS was pre-2013, which is basically Al-Qaeda, right? This is a group that still posed a threat. Uh, and unlike Al-Qaeda, they have been much better at figuring out how to incite people in the West uh, through nothing more than a telegram uh, communication. Um, so that, the, 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 the remote controlled attacks, um, this is what the, the French prosecutor called it last Friday uh, regarding the three young women who were just arrested uh, with gas canisters uh, near Notre Dame. Um, he was calling it a remote controlled uh, attack. Namely, they were in touch with a handler who was in Syria, who was giving them detailed instructions on what target to choose, et cetera, and, and coaching and, and uh, general encouragement. And that was enough to put them over the edge. And that will continue, I, I believe, even once the territorial caliphate is, is erased. I'm yes. sorry, but we yeah. can't take any more questions because we have to go upstairs to a simulation, OK? I want to thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, and enjoy the simulation.